Manny Machado's name has been mentioned ad nauseum. But what if they don't get Manny Machado? Is there other players in the league? Are there other ones that actually exist, Peter? There are other players in the league, yes. But everybody's all excited about Machado, and if they don't get him, then what do you do? Well, let's uh, talk to Corey Seidman here on the Sports Pass Live on 97.3 ESPN and get some of his thoughts on, well, if not Machado, then who, and this Phillies team at the All-Star break. Corey, welcome aboard. How are you, pal? I'm great, guys. It's a very busy time of year, and the Manny Machado situation seems to be changing by the hour now, doesn't it? It does. It sure does. And, uh, you know, last night it seemed like the Phillies were kind of in control of this. It has kind of shifted to the Dodgers. Let me ask you, do you think the Phillies, though, have – the best package like can they just say you know what we'll up our package and trump whatever la might do absolutely i mean that's why this is all very fluid you know there are reports coming out today usa today john Heyman of fan cred that the dodgers are now the favorite but this always happens i mean this could easily just be a ploy by the orioles to try to entice the phillies to up their package we know that the phillies are willing to include adonis medina who's their number two prospect a pitcher uh, the Dodgers have a very intriguing outfielder, who's Neil Diaz, that is the 51st overall ranked prospect by Baseball America that apparently L.A. is willing to include in the trade for Machado. But, you know, before all of this Phillies and Machado talk picked up again last weekend, I wrote that I expected the Dodgers and Brewers to make a bigger push than the Phillies for Machado because these are teams that are in win-now mode, especially the Dodgers. You know, they their window is not going to be open forever. Clayton Kershaw is not going to be there forever. And they lost Corey Seager, their best all-around player, their shortstop. So it's a way for them to add a shortstop in Machado. I don't think the Dodgers are going to make you know an extreme bid for Machado this offseason because Corey Seager is their long-term shortstop and Machado wants to play shortstop long-term. But I do think that the Dodgers are more in a position to overpay for Machado in a trade than are the Phillies because the Phillies' window is just opening. It doesn't really make a lot of sense for them to engage in a bidding war that just gets pricier and pricier and pricier, even though Machado's by far the best available player at the trade deadline. Hey, Corey, at this stage, like, I, I talked about this earlier, how the National League seems like the NBA's Eastern Conference. Like, you know, there's a lot of pretty good teams. I don't know that there's a clear-cut favorite. Does landing Manny Machado shoot you – to the top of the list in the National League? If you're the Dodgers, yes. If you're the Phillies, no. I mean, he would be a significant boost to the Phillies. There's no question about it. There's no player available that's going to make a bigger impact in August and September in terms of on-field, in terms of fans in the stands. But I don't think that that single move pushes the Phillies well past the Cubs, well past the Dodgers. I think it would make them the prohibitive favorite in the National League East with how poorly the Nationals, Nationals have played all season. But, Pete, your point is a good one. That, that is a, a good analogy, the National League to the Eastern Conference, because you look at the AL, the four best teams in baseball are in the American League, Red Sox, Yankees, Astros, and Indians. And then the NL is kind of a crapshoot at this point. But even if the Phillies are not able to acquire Machado, they're going to make upgrades to this team, and it's not going to just be one player, I would think. And they're going to make upgrades. You write an article on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. Corey, who are some of those names that you think they should go after? So the, the, the clear names of players on selling teams that the Phillies could go after that would provide uh, some more offensive versatility, Eduardo Escobar of the Twins, a guy who's having a career year, leads the majors with 35 doubles, has been the best player in the majors this season with runners in scoring position. Not that that's a translatable, long-term, sustainable skill set, uh, you know, the batting average is runners in scoring position, but it is something worth mentioning. Whit Merrifield of the Royals, a guy who's a super utility man who's under team control for four and a half seasons, not just a half season like Manny Machado. That's a guy who could be a, you know, a piece of the Phillies' future, not even just this season. Then you look at a team like the Blue Jays. Jim Salisbury, my colleague at NBC Sports Philadelphia, reported yesterday that the Phillies are still interested in Jay Happ. And, you know, Toronto's an intriguing fit with the Phils because they should acquire multiple pieces from the Blue Jays. Curtis Granderson could help on the bench. Now, Garibus Solarte could help on the left side of the infield. And there's also Josh Donaldson. I think a lot of people forget about him because he's been injured for the last two months, hasn't played since Memorial Day when he hurt his calf. But this is a guy who was an MVP three years ago, who has hit close to 300 with averages of 33 homers and 100 RBIs the last five seasons. And he's a free agent this season's end as well. So that's a guy that you probably don't have to pay a ton for in a trade because of the injury history the last two years and because of the contract status. So, you know, even if the Phils don't get Machado, I wrote in that piece that, you know, if they were to strike a deal with the Blue Jays to acquire Hap, Solarte, and Curtis Granderson, that improves the rotation, it improves the bullpen, it improves the bench, and it improves the infield. 
one-stop shopping all with one team. Corey Seisman is with us, Philly's analyst for NBC Sports Philadelphia. You see him on pre and post with all the nuggets of information that he brings because he goes in depth all the time. So, Corey, uh, the reports, of course, you see social media all the time. Cole Hamels had breakfast in Ocean City yesterday. Everybody got excited. Cole Hamels is returning. I mean, where do you stand on Cole Hamels? Would you like to see him come back, or do you think that's the deal the Phillies should pass on? I think they should pass. It doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Hamels is not having a good year. Last two seasons, he has clearly declined. I mean, he's allowing a lot of home runs because he's always around the plate, and he doesn't have a big fastball. You know, he's thrown around 90 miles per hour. Last year, his strikeout rate plummeted. This year, it's kind of returned to normal fee, but I just don't see Hamels as a, as a significant upgrade in the rotation, and you have to also account for the fact that he has a $20 million team option next year that can be bought out for $6 million. So I don't know that it makes sense for the Phillies whether they would be wanting to exercise the $20 million or even pay the $6 million to let him walk next season. I just don't think Hamels is a meaningful enough upgrade. I'm not saying that Jay Happ is substantially better than Hamels, but the fact that Happ would be more of a rental, the fact that Happ had a stronger start to the season, you know, and the fact that he's more deceptive, he's remained deceptive with that fastball and that arm slot all through these years, I think he would be more of an upgrade than Hamels. Beltre or Mustakis, did we bring those names up yet? I don't think we did. We did, and Adrian Beltre, there are some indications that he wants to stay in Texas and that he wants to re-sign there. He's, re- he's re-up there a couple times. He seems to be happy there, even though they're not a contending team. As far as Mike Moustakis, you know, it was, it was a thought earlier in the season. The Phillies scouted the, the Royals prospects, the Royal, or the Phillies scouted the Royals players, the Royals scouted the Phillies prospects. But at this point, Mike Moustakis isn't much of an upgrade over Michael Franco. Franco, over the last six weeks, says, honestly, he's been one of the better hitters in baseball. He has better numbers the last six weeks than Aaron Judge, than Freddie Freeman. You know, on a season, he has a higher OPS than a lot of big names. I'm not saying that Franco is definitely the long-term answer at third base, but I don't know that it makes a whole lot of sense to trade for Moustakis, uh, especially if you're giving up Franco in that deal. Right. Newsflash, Michael Franco has actually been pretty successful down at the 8-0 or down lower in the order. See, a lot of people miss that. They just write him off and think like, oh, well, he's no good. you got to go get somebody else, but he's been pretty decent. You have a good story up, too, about under-the-radar first half trends and uh, Carlos Santana man yeah that's great he walks but I mean come on uh, Carlos Santana really isn't having a great first half no I mean I, it, he had that that really really strong month of May where he was carrying the Phillies offense with all those extra base hits but he hasn't done that lately he has three extra base hits in his last 90 plate appearances he's at 132 over his last 23 games so yeah it's great that he walks and he walks a whole lot more than he strikes out but it's not like he's a plus base runner. He has not been a plus defensive first baseman. And as you said, he's hitting 209. So, you know, the, there are five players on the Phillies that have higher OPS than Carlos Santana. I don't think that's what they had in mind when they signed him to that $60 million contract. They're hoping for, you know, a better second half from Santana. And he has, in his career, been much better the final two months than he has the first three. So they're still holding out hope. But right now the Phillies just aren't getting enough pop out of the four and five spots in the lineup. Yeah, it seems that uh, they got – issues with the lineup, but they've also got starting depth, uh, pitching depth issues, and bullpen issues. So, Corey, if you had your druthers and they could add one, which is the main target? Uh, you know, offense. For me, it's offense, just because, you know, I think a Philly starting pitching has enough to hold up over the second half of the season. I think we'll see some better signs from Jake Arrieta. Aaron Nola is, you know, legitimately a Cy Young candidate. And then you have guys like Pavetta and Velasquez who have helped carry them in this first half. Offensively, though, especially in these last two weeks when they've averaged 2.9 runs per game and you have so many players who are cold at the same time, and this is um, this team is more streaky than a lot of other contending teams. The fact that, like, Pereira, Santana, when they're not hitting, they become near zeros at the plate. So, you know, without a doubt, to me, they need to add another big bat in the middle of the lineup to keep up with these other National League teams. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting dynamic, Corey, that we see a lot in sports now where, you know, a couple of years ago, Washington, they pulled Strasburg, you know, and the thought was, we'll be here all the time, he'll pitch the next time. They've never got to a World Series. That concept of... Do you go for it now or take multiple chances down the line? Do you think the Phillies kind of look at this season as house money and saying, hey, we didn't really think that we'd be here anyway, so we'll just kind of wait it out and take our chances down the road? Or is it a necessity to take your shot when it's presented to you? So I think that because the NL is wide open, that it makes sense for the Phillies to be in talks for as many players as they are. But everything that Andy McPhail has indicated, that John Middleton has indicated, is that they're focused on long-term, long-term success, sustainability in the National League. And that's the way that they're building. I mean, they still have guys like 
Aaron Nola, for example, has been the biggest bargain among any pitcher in baseball this season when you look at the production compared to the fact that he's making $573,000. Reese Hoskins, still very inexpensive. So the window is it's open, and it's going to stay open for what the Phillies hope is a pretty long time, and that's why, you know, to harken back to Machado, it makes more sense for a win-now club like the Dodgers or the Brewers or the Diamondbacks to overpay for Machado. And the Orioles, if you're in their perspective, they have to win this trade because they don't have any other big-time assets aside from Machado that is going to help propel their rebuild, and that's a team that's going to be in a lot of pain for a lot of years. Is there any player in the organization that you would be uh, back out concerned about giving up? Well, Sixto Sanchez, obviously, because it's a guy who, you know, has an 100-mile-per-hour fastball that he can command. Uh, he hasn't had, you know, as, I guess, successful of a season as many people wanted to see. He spent some time on the shelf with an injury. Uh, but I wouldn't include him. You know, I obviously wouldn't include any of these these major league-ready pieces that the Phillies have. Like, you're not going to include, you know, a Hoskins or a Kingery or, a, or a, you know, any, any of the starting pitchers currently on their staff. In terms of the prospects, though, aside from six, though, you know, Manny Machado was such a difference-making, transcending, transcendent talent that I think that you got to pretty much open up shop for everybody else. But I'm not talking about multiples of that. I'm not talking about the second, third, and fourth-ranked prospects in the organization. Maybe one of them is enough. Hey, Corey, what about Eflin? Because there's a report about him. Would you be willing to part with him? Yeah, no chance. I mean, Eflin's under team control for another five years, and you don't trade that for two months, especially with the bona fide improvements that we've seen out of Eflin. It's not like he's just been lucky here on a little bit of a run. This is a guy who has increased velocity. He has an increased usage of his forcing fastball. He's doubled his strikeout rate. He's transformed almost from a pure sinker baller to a guy who can beat you in a variety of ways and whose repertoire plays really well in this modern game with the launch angle and the obsession with hitters and power. Yeah, the game has changed so much, Corey. You know, I look back at the Phillies runs, you know, 07, 08, 09, and it seemed that they gave up a lot of prospects, and literally the only one that I can think of that has kind of made it is Carrasco. I mean, all of those players that they gave up in the past to get, you know, Lee and Halliday and others, it doesn't seem that any of them really worked out other than Carrasco. That's why it seems like, you know what, if you have a chance to give up something to get a proven guy of this caliber, you almost have to do it. But I, I get the whole free agent thing really looms over this deal, but – you know, that's why I'm not as willing, as as worried about giving up prospects. No, I agree. I mean, they also included Jay Happ in the Roy Oswald trade, and he's definitely panned out. I mean, he's a guy who won True. 20 games a couple of years ago, and he's had a really good major league career, better than I think a lot of people expected. That's a good point, though. I mean, that shows that when you trade quantity of prospects, that not a whole lot of them are going to pan out. And that, again, is why I think that the Orioles are just going after the best player, the best prospect. And if they going to see quality over quantity because of how many prospects just do not pan out. Uh, Corey Simon at uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia does a great job uh, on the Phillies broadcast and writing about the Phillies at C. Simon NBCS. You can check out his Phillies coverage there. And he was kind enough to join us here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Corey, thanks so much, pal. Thanks, guys. Great to talk to you. Thank yeah. you, Corey. I uh, always enjoy watching his television work as you. 